guys, this is Tobias DL3MHT. Um, the final video, maybe, <laughs> for my TH79E repair. And this time it's uh, about, um, well, replacing all the electrolytic SMD capacitors. So the first thing you do is dismantle everything again and get the front board out. And in the meantime, I've done it so many times that I am able to do that quite quickly. Uh, I think I just I forgot a little lock switch. That was the only thing holding it back in. And here we are. Um, the board is out. And then I tried, uh, if I do it on my PCB holder, um, and I decided I won't do it on the PCB holder because in order to do that, I would have needed to take the display out again. And since the display is now working, I didn't want to touch that. So I just do this refurbishment right on my bench, on my electrostatic mat. And I didn't wear my electrostatic wristband, which was also a mistake. Um, and as you can see, I already got the first capacitor out using two soldering irons, one in the left hand, one in the right hand. And I got it out and measured the ESR. And uh, here's the new one. So Tinder pads bit of flux on top double check the orientation from a photo that I took earlier and then basically hold it down with one finger while you go alternatively on the left and the right pad and press down so at the beginning the capacitor doesn't sit flush because one pad is basically soldered down and the other one not but if you go backwards and forwards two or three times then that works quite nicely and here I'm removing the, I think that's the volume knob because it is in the way and um, yeah, uh, it's easier to take it out to get an angle to attack the capacitors on the backside of the board. And yeah, of course you also have to use flux and solder wick, but in the end I got it out. You have to be patient with these things, don't force it. Because if you pull, then it's easy to rip a trace. So you have to really heat it up and it has to come out on its own account. And here I'm yeah, cleaning up the pads now again with solar wick. And I'm sorry if my head is uh, quite a few times in the shot because obviously my main target here was to um, fix the handset and uh, not to make the world's best YouTube video. So another mediocre video. Okay, so now we go um, and do the whole row of capacitors on the bottom. So first the 10 microfarad one and it's out 220 I think, out 33 and 22. And that, as you can see, that works quite well. Yeah, if you use enough flux and have two soldering irons and maybe um, if it's a bit, uh, if the solder is not so good, heat it before, so uh, apply a bit of fresh solder, but that works quite well, that technique for me. Of course, a proper JBC luxury soldering plier with two heated prongs would be much more convenient because you just, well, basically go with the plier to your capacitor and pick it off the board. But that way also works. Um, it's less elegant, but for my clueless hobby purposes, it works. And yeah, after taking the capacitors off, of course, I'm cleaning off the old solder with the uh, solder wick and then some excessive cleaning with IPA and uh, some old t-shirt cloth. Um, I have a electrostatic brush, but I don't know, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I mean, whenever I use that, I'm just evenly distributing the flux over the whole board. So the cloth works a bit better for me uh, with the con side that you have fibers, uh, cloth fibers on your board afterwards, but no more flux. Okay, here, just for fun, I'm measuring all the capacitors that I took off and they're much better than on the first training um, TH79E, so that uh, those were a bit better. Okay, I quickly showed you, but um, 
didn't slow down the video. It doesn't matter. Uh, the summary is they were much better, but still had quite high ESR. None of them measured open circuit, so they all still had capacitance. But um, ESR was a bit high. So here we have brand new capacitors from Mauser, uh, Panasonic ones. Um, and for peace of mind, I did not measure their ESR. Otherwise, I would probably figure out that a few that I put in are not so much better than the ones I took out. But anyway, they are the right size. They are the right voltage. They are from Panasonic. Um, and I ordered them from Mauser. So um, chances are they are uh, genuine, uh, original Panasonic capacitors. And of course, you can when you do these things, you can always argue, why do you put uh, the same leaky electrolytic capacitors back in that you removed? Use some ceramic ones, but there's different schools of thought, and I'm not skilled enough to look at an electrolytic capacitor and see, oh yeah, that has... That is uh, ESR, uh, low ESR, high ESR, ripple, etc. and find an equivalent ceramic one. I, it's, it's just easier to take the part out and uh, put exactly the same part in again. And yeah, as you can see, I'm just working my way through the capacitors. Luckily, it's not so many, but there are... Um, tiny resistors and capacitors around it so you have to be a bit careful use a fine enough tip but not too fine that you don't, cannot get heat onto the board and make sure you're not accidentally nudging some resistor or capacitor off so that's the third I think 33 microfarad one and I always uh, checked um, a picture. I took a snapshot before um, how they are oriented because then it's just easy. You just look at the picture and put the new one in in the same orientation that you took the old one off. In the meantime, I also spent, I don't know, 30 bucks, 35 bucks on a service manual that was shipped from the UK and shredded in international shipping a little bit. So I now have a service manual for this thing, which is of course handy when you really have a bug or a mistake because it shows you the schematic, uh, the component placement on the PCB and it also shows the PCB tracks, at least on those um, early Kenwoods, I think it's just double layer PCB with via, uh, vias, so it's not like a six layer PCB. So it's quite easy to trace the part. I have to scan that in somehow and upload it. But it's not so easy because it's a um, the component placement diagram is a, like a big fold-out poster consisting of like uh, six pages. And I have to somehow get it onto the scanner uh, bit by bit and then somehow assemble the image so that you get the full component placement. So it's a bit of a hassle. Uh, I had a first go at scanning the manual and it, uh, yeah, I mean all the pages which are just uh, letter size or DIN A4 size are fine, but the pictures uh, of the component placement and the schematic are a bit tricky to scan. I have to scan them and then somehow um, assemble them. Okay, here I'm checking uh, all my capacitors under the inspection microscope and I found out that one of the capacitors sits a bit wonky or too wonky for the German in me. It does not sit properly on the pad. So I had another go and took that one off again. Same procedure as last year. Miss Sophie uh, cleaning the pads. Get rid of the excess flux, apply fresh flux and try to get it on straight the second time. And of course uh, all the 
Heat is also not good for electrolytic capacitors, so you should not fry for hours with your soldering iron. But I think generally using a soldering iron is still less heat stress than using a hot air station. So I think this is maybe the... Well, less thermal stress way of doing it. Okay, I got it on. Some more excessive scrubbing. And now we basically have to put it back into the front panel after I'm happy. No, we are not done yet. First, we have to get the rotary encoder back on uh, or the volume key. So I unscrewed the bracket that is on the front panel and used it basically to screw the two knobs together so that the alignment is fine. And then I um, soldered in the volume knob again. And then you can take that bracket off and put it back into the front housing where it belongs. And now we have the two knobs perfectly aligned and it's also soldered in again. So what's still missing? Yeah, I think the, the RF board where, where you do the RF adjustments um, has to go back in now. So put it back on and solder that one ground pin back onto the PCB. And cleaning again. Okay, but now we are almost there to here put the key mat back in, put the conductive rubber thingies for the speaker back in. The PTT PCB, clean the display from fingerprints and also the inside of the front housing from any dust or whatever. And then we can wiggle it back in. And that plastic thingy that sits under the keypad, screw it in. Not over tighten the plastic screws. And uh, then I spent too much time in getting the flex cable back in because it always looked wonky, whatever I did. So maybe I, I don't know, need a I used the back side of my pliers to push it in, but I first pushed on the left and then on the right side and maybe I need just something uh, wider to basically press the whole flex cable in in one go. It still looked slightly wonky after three attempts. So in the end, I checked if uh, volume was fine on both bands and as that was the case, I left it like that. And I initially wanted to replace the flex cable as well. Um, but somehow I ordered an 800 millimeter flex cable instead of an 80 millimeter one. So somehow the, yeah, <laughs> somehow the AliExpress order <laughs> went wrong. So I have a very long 26 pin 0 0.5 inch uh, cable now. Okay. And uh, yeah, the second half of the operation was um, adjusting the contrast. And initially I just um, adjusted the contrast of the LCD display by looking at it. But uh, the service manual says it's 1.5 volt. Uh, oddly enough, it measures negative voltage and not positive voltage. I'm not sure what did I do wrong here. Maybe flip the leads, but COM is COM. And the other pin was on the test point. And I soldered a little wire to the test point to make it easier to adjust because then you can just leave that thing lying on the desk and fiddle with the tiny, tiny, tiny SMD trimmer. And yeah, here I first adjusted it to the 1.5 volt and then checked the contrast. And in the end, I decided it was a bit too low contrast for me. So I thought, okay, I replaced the front polarizer. Maybe things are a little bit different. I set it to 1.6 volt and uh, that's still within spec, 1.5 plus mi minus 0 0.1 volt. And I spent a little bit too much time in getting it to exactly 1.6 volt. Here I checked with a 
uh, a different LED light and not the ring light, which was flickering and had the contrast with the ring light was always looking much higher than in daylight. But here you can see we got it to 1.599, but God knows how accurate this Voltcraft voltmeter is. So it's all just in my head. <laughs> anyway, it's set to 1.6 volt or close to 1.6 volt in the end. And when I was happy with it, I could yeah, basically desolder that wire that I put onto the test point, wick off the excess solder, clean it off with IPA, and then we are ready for assembly, tightening the nuts on the knobs, put the rubber gasket in, the top housing, the knobs, um, and I think the little lock switch on the side also goes back on. And here I'm fiddling with a little um, bit of tape that goes on top. Um, when I swapped the back side, I had to cut that. And it uh, said in the service manual, this is, um, I don't know, protection against humidity. Of course, I didn't have the right tape. This is a tape I got from AliExpress for fixing LCDs. So one of these heat resistant Tape, tapes is probably not waterproof but better than nothing so I put that in then um, well all the screws go back in and I'm fiddling with the CTCSS unit out of frame but now that's in as well and we are ready for a little test queue so CQ2 Meter von Delta Lima 3 Mike Hotel Tango DL3 MHT ruft CQ. Of course, that is Germany, so I have to do it in German. Delta Lima 3 Mike Hotel Tango, hier ist Delta Golf 8 Mike Delta Alpha. Delta Golf 8 Mike Delta Alpha oder Mike Golf Alpha, jetzt war ich nicht schnell genug. Vielen Dank, dass du zurückkommst, lieber OM. Kannst du mir kurz einen Rapport geben? Alles klar, vielen Dank. Das ist ein uraltes Kenwood TH79E und da war ich gerade mit dem Lötkolben dran und habe alle SMD-Kondensatoren mal ausgewechselt. Also ich bin froh, dass das Gerät noch funktioniert. Vielen Dank äh, fürs kurze QSO. Ich wünsche dir einen schönen Abend. 73. Ja, 73. Für den DL3 MHT. Okay, so that's it for the moment uh, with the TH79E refurbishment. I have one working one and another working one where the LCD display is a bit broken, but I already replaced all the SMD capacitors and fixed the diode matrix. So it would be a nice challenge to get the second one working as well. Maybe following in the footsteps of the UAM who did the LCD replacement, I saw he posted um, the source code for the STM32 microcontroller he used. Um, and also, I think somewhere in his videos, there is the correct IPS display mentioned. So it would be maybe a nice challenge to get the second one working as well, but I'm not sure. Maybe I need a small break now from uh, Kenwood handsets and do something else. Uh, so let's see what the year brings. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope that uh, series was not too boring. Uh, January is very slow in YouTube, so I'm not sure if that video just had no interest or everybody is still digesting their uh, Christmas lunch. So thanks for watching and until next time. 73.